Oh my goodness. Yeah, they put me at 9 o'clock in the morning. Hopefully nobody will show up. <laughs> yeah, that's the truth. I brought my special uh, version. It's called the Cotton Patch Version of Paul's Epistles. I'll share that with you in a minute. No, I didn't translate it. I've got to use it as a... As a ha, anybody ever seen the Cotton Patch Version? Anybody? A couple of you? Boy, it's a mess, isn't it? Wow. But anyway, we'll talk about that in a little bit here. Um, my... Um, my uh, appreciation, Brother Green, for hosting this, and uh, I'm thankful. Yesterday, I was able to help him with uh, the fact that he's not as old as he thought he was. He, he got up and he was announcing all the guys that have preached here before, and I preached here once. And he's standing, he's trying to figure out, I don't remember him. And see, I, it's because I'm not real memorable, or memorable, you know, maybe, or what. He can't remember that. He, he doesn't know. So he's thinking he's getting Alzheimer's or something. And I, well, he was worried about dementia, I think. And uh, I uh, had put him right. He was on vacation when I was here about 12 years ago. And uh, he invited me to come and didn't want to come then either. So this, this time I'm going to get to preach to him. I'm excited about that. Brother Green, it's great. It's an honor to be here. It's good to see Tara back there. Tara Hurley. I've known her since she was uh, knee-high to a grasshopper. Her dad and I go way back. I met him when uh, I was 22, and he was 32. And now I'm not 22 anymore, Brother Brown. No, I'm going to be a grandpa. I'm excited about that. My oldest son uh, told me a couple weeks ago uh, I'm going to be a grandpa. And uh, my wife is now married to a grandpa. Bless her heart. And uh, anyway... Uh, I'd like you to turn in your Bibles, if you would. We're going to start in the Bible. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Joshua, Joshua chapter 22, and I'm looking for a clock. Folks just took the clock down at my church. There it is. Okay, so I've got to what time again? 45 minutes. Okay, so I need to be done about 10 till or so, something like that. Okay, all right. Um, Joshua chapter 22 is where I'm just, we're going to start with this story. Um, the message that I have for you today is why I believe the King James Version should not be updated. Now, um, this, this message comes, I, I could say why we don't believe, but this is really me. And as Brother Brown already said, I have private heresies that nobody else in the council wants to endorse. So, so I have to say, this is my thoughts, but I think some of the council would agree with me on most of this stuff here that I'm going to say today, I think. Um, a lot of questions are coming to me from younger preachers. Um, there's been some new books come out recently that are supposedly loving, I call them patronizing, to King James Bible believers. But they're trying to tell us that we are, um, you know, we really need to get with the times and that the language has changed so much that everything needs to be updated. And so some of these younger guys are saying, well, you know, why not? Why not update the King James? You know, it's been 400 years and, and uh, you know, there are words that are different now and Boy, what if we do that? And so I'm, ta I'm hearing this from a lot of young uh, fundamental Baptist pre you know, preachers, young boys that are, that, are, that are great, full of God and them vinegar and stale jokes, you know, just, just ready to go. And uh, so I've been thinking about those questions. And so my, my presentation today is not one of, can I say, dogmatism. It's more, I want to give you some questions. I want to ask ask some questions. So if we were to update, what would that look like? Those are, that's how we're going to approach this. Okay. And I basically have 10 questions. And I'm going to try to get them all in. But as a, as a jumping off place for this, these thoughts and these questions, I want to take you to a place in Joshua chapter 20, uh, 22. And uh, I want to talk to you about an altar named Ed. An altar named Ed. Joshua 22, verse 34. And the children of Reuben and the children of Gad called the altar Ed. Isn't that a fun verse? I wish I'd have seen that when I was in high school. I would have asked if I could memorize that one instead of some of the ones they gave me. 
For it shall be a witness between us and, the, and that the Lord is God. An altar named Ed. Let's bow for prayer. God, thank you for this opportunity. I'm so privileged to, to, to be speaking in this conference among some of my heroes. And uh, Lord, I, I thank you for Brother Green and the, the, the hospitality of this church. Uh, Lord, I'm so thankful that we have this opportunity to present these things. God, I pray that the Holy Spirit now would fill my mind and heart and that, God, your words uh, would, would be what's remembered. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me tell you the background of this altar just a little bit. So what happened was uh, the children of Israel are going into the promised land. And um, we have three tribes. We have Reuben. Uh, we have Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh. And they're coming up to the Jordan River. And they say, is it okay if I move? Thank you. So they come up to the Jordan River and they say, um, boy, we like this. We got a lot of cattle. We like all of this um, ground here. Uh, we, you know, you guys can go on into the promised land. We're, we're good. And Joshua said, look, boys, uh, that ain't how it's going to be. God gave us the land on the other side, Jordan. But I get what you're saying. This is pretty good land. So... And I'm kind of paraphrasing, please forgive me, at a King James conference. And so, so what happened was um, they, they said, I better come off the pulpit since I'm paraphrasing, so I'm telling you the story. So, so, so what happened was the, um, they made a deal. And so uh, Ruman, Gad, and half-tribe of Manasseh, they said, okay, uh, all the soldiers, the guys that can hear his sword, you guys come with us across Jordan. You can leave your families, your wives and children, all your cattle here so you don't have to drag them along. But you guys come with us and you help us possess the land of Canaan. And when we're done, then you guys go back to your families and everything's good. So that's what they did. When you hear about the stories of Jericho, you know, um, Reuben, Gad, half tribe of Manasseh, those boys are there ready to fight and their families are not there. So their families didn't walk around Jericho. They stayed on the other side of Jordan. Okay. So when the land was conquered, Reuben and Gad and this half tribe of Manasseh comes to Joshua and say, okay, we're ready to go back to our family. And Joshua says, okay, we're going to release you. You've done what you're supposed to do. You go back over there. So you cross back over Jordan and they're, they're getting together and they're like, boys, you know what? The Jordan River, you know, opened past. And we, you know, they're over there. You know what? Their kids are going to look at our kids and say, what are you doing here? You don't have anything to do with us. And we don't want that. We want our kids to follow God. And so how are we going to fix this? So they went over in a very public place and they erected this altar, kind of a monument. They did not burn sacrifices on it. And they, they made this huge altar and they called it Ed. Ed, isn't that great? And I love that. And so um, they build this altar and the children of Israel on the other side of Jordan, they're like, whoa, boys, we just left Egypt. We just got rid of all the gods of the Canaanites. We killed everybody that worshiped these gods. Get your swords, Benjamin, Judah, and all the men of war. We're going to kill Reuben, Gad, and half tribe of Manasseh. We're going to kill them all. They've got an altar that's not the right altar. What is, the, what is the matter here? Something wrong. And so they mount up this charge and they go across and they meet with these tribe leaders and they say, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? You guys have sinned against God. Don't you remember Baal, Peor, how that Balaam and Balak taught the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and God killed so many of us because of it. He was angry. Don't you remember this, the deal with Achan? Don't you remember what God, they were like, hmm? don't you guys remember? They were old fundamentalists over there. And they had their swords and they were going to kill them all. And Reuben and Gad and Manasseh, they said, look boys, we're not going to sacrifice all, anything on there. We just want our children to know that they are part of what's going on, what God's got going on. And so we put this altar up there and we've done this so that we can stay connected to you guys. And Judah and Reuben, they're like, okay, Phineas, 
Oh, I love Phineas. He was the one. He's probably the one leading the charge. Remember Phineas? You remember him, right? Do a study on him sometime. He's fun. He's the guy, he, he heard somebody was doing something wrong in the tent. And he took his spear and went and ran him through in the tent. He was cleaning him up. Uh, he believed in God. He believed in God's judgment. And so Phineas says, okay, boys, that sounds like a pretty good thing. Let's, um, okay, put your swords away. Let's, let's go back home and let's leave them alone. You guys better never sacrifice on that altar. If you do, we're going we're gonna to come kill you. End of story. And wow, what an interesting story. But the things I get out of that, three things I get out of that. First thing is that there are some things worth fighting about. Well, boy, we could say that again, couldn't we? Is, can I stand up here? Um, there are some things worth fighting about, are they not? Some things we should get angry about. Is that not true? But then there's some things we should just talk about and put our swords away. Some things we should come to agreements on. Different, right? And the third thing I notice, and there's some things to be afraid of. Brother Rockwell, I'm afraid of God. I'm afraid of God's wrath. Aren't you? I don't want to make him mad. I know what he can do. I mean, I don't know all he can do, but my goodness, how big is God? And, uh, you know, he can stop the winds. He can stop my heart. You know, he orders every breath. So what happens if he ignores you for a few minutes? You know, these atheists get up and say, they say, uh, I don't believe in God. You know, God's saying, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in. Hold it. Hold on. <laughs> you don't believe in who? <laughs> God can do all of those things. I think we should be afraid of God. I think we should be. And so I think that's the issue we need to come to with this whole conversation. There are some things about the translation we should fight about. And you've heard about it yesterday. What a great conference yesterday. Some of the best presentations I've heard in all the years I've been coming. It was really good. Um, some things we shouldn't fight about. Right? Right? I think what Brother Ziner said yesterday, uh, where are you, preacher? There he is back there. What you said yesterday about taking that Bible and throwing it on the floor and stomping on it. Come on, guys. There are some good words in there. Don't stomp on all of it, right? Let's have some conversations. But we should be afraid of God. Now, having said all that, that's the sermon for today. Now let's talk about the lecture. All right, so my questions about if you're going to update the King James Bible. If you want to do that, okay, let's, let's honestly listen to the questions. If you want to raise this altar, Ed, or whatever you want to do, let's talk about it, okay? Find out. And I don't think it's completely the same, but I'm just telling you, let's talk about it, right? Is that fair? Yeah. So let's ask this question. First of all, if you update the King James Bible, first question is who would use it? The people that want a new translation already have the ESV, the MEV, the Legacy Bible. They already don't care. They're the ones that want a new one. So they got one that I think is messed up. But why would they go to an updated King James? They're not going to. So who's going to use it? Um... I did, a, I did a research on this a little bit. Uh, David Murray from the Presbyterian Churches of America, of all things. Can I say that here? Presbyterian. <laughs> They're our brethren that are down the street. You know, They call them the old historic Baptists. That's what they call themselves. When, uh, when Americans reach for their Bibles, here's what David Murray said. When Americans reach for their Bibles, more than half of them pick up a King James Version. The 55% who read the KJV easily outnumber the 19% who read the New International Version. The percentage drop into the single digits for competitors, such as the New Revised Standard Version, the New American Bible, and the Living Bible. Um, the KJV also received almost 45% of the Bible translation-related searches on, the, on Google. So Google, 45% used the King James Bible when they're researching. Compared with almost 24% for the NIV according to Bible Gateway Stephen Smith. 
So who would use it? And honestly, how are you going to get it out if you say, okay, this is God's update? How are you going to convince everyone that it's good? How, how, how are we going to learn to trust you? That's my first question. I could stop there, right? Really, who's going to use it? Second question is, hasn't this already been attempted? So, so um, NKGV 1975. So I was raised in a fundamental Baptist uh, pastor's home. My dad passed away in 94 after 40 years of ministry. And um, he was a King James guy. I mean, back before it was popular. Um, they were... You know, if they were fighting the Revised Standard Version still. I remember hearing all of the guys preaching against it. I, I cut my teeth on Edward Hills and David Otis Fuller. Those are the ones I, I grew up learning from. When I was nine years old, I was in trouble a lot, um, causing trouble. I, I know you, that may be, come as a surprise, but my mother grabbed me by the ear and took me down to my dad's basement office. And she said, here, he's yours. And uh, she sat me down. My dad put a little desk in his office and he gave me three books. He gave me Bible Doctrines by Mark Cambron. He gave me a Greek uh, text from uh, Moody Bible Institute. And he gave me Einstein's Theory of Relativity. And he said, boy, this is your summer. And uh, I learned, started learning Greek at nine years old. Learned Bible Doctrines. I've been through that Bible Doctrines book about ten times. Um... We, we, we started reading Revelation by the time every, we would read Revelation through, through once a week as a family. I've read, I've read Revelation through over a thousand times because of that. God, I'm thank God for my dad doing that for me. Boy, it changes your outlook on the Bible, I'll be honest with you. But, um, so, that's where I come from. In 1975... These guys got together and came out with a New King James Version. So I remember, there was all this conversation, I was a kid... That was the year I'm talking about, 1975. I was nine years old. That year, I was starting to become aware of things going on in my dad's office and fights he was having on the Bible because I'm sitting there listening. And uh, he's, he, I remember him, him fussing and fuming a little bit. And, and I remember the conversation about the NKJV. And I remember how it came out. And wow, this is the update on the King James Version. And at first, everybody got excited like, okay, finally, we got our Bible, and it's updated now. This is great. And they started looking at it, and like, whoa, wait. What? Same thing that um, Dean Bergon discovered some years ago when he was looking at the updated in 1881. First of all, everybody's like, okay, we're going to listen. We're gonna, and I want to I say to you, this, those of you watching online, King James guys oftentimes are very approachable. <laughs> Once in a while, we're not. But most of the time... And, and you come up with something that's a viable thing, we'll, we'll look at it. But because we want truth. Truth can stand scrutiny. Never forget that. You can look at If it's true, you can look at it at the top side, the bottom side, the side side. You can look any angle you want, ask any questions, and it'll still be true. And so we'll, we'll look at that. You know, it's okay. So we're, and all of a sudden we start saying, what? I remember opening a copy and reading the book of Daniel. My name is Daniel, and so Daniel was my hero. And I'm reading the book of Daniel, and it says, Now this Daniel was preferred above all the satraps. And I'm like, New King James Version. Satraps? What's that? And I went back to my King James Bible, and it said, uh, Babylonian princes and presidents. I'm like, oh, I know what that is. I don't know what a satrap is. So the New King James Version turned out to be a great disappointment. Not only was it more college level language in some cases. Yeah. Now they fixed the these and thous, bless their hearts. But, but um, and then it followed some of the other things that well, I won't get into right now because I don't have time. But it followed um, like Kittle's uh, Old Testament. If you're not familiar with Kittle, uh, Gerard Kittle and Rudolf Kittle were two guys that uh, helped Hitler... Uh, actually, uh, I think Rudolf Kittel, uh, was his, one of his propaganda specialists helped him convince, uh, convince everyone that the Jews should be exterminated. Now, Rudolf Kittel wrote a commentary set. I have a copy in my office because I wanted to see what he actually said. And he's, he's the darling of a lot of people because him and his son produced a lexicon. Hebrew lexicons used in a lot of Bible colleges today. 
dirty little secret is at the end of World War II, Gerard, Gerard Kittle was convicted for Nazi war crimes and put in prison against the Jews. Can I remind you of Romans 3? What advantage hath the Jew? Much every way. For chiefly to them was committed the oracles of God. How can a guy handling the Bible be anti-Semitic? How? Hello? So the NKJV was a great disappointment. 21st century KJ, uh, century KJV came up. AV, I don't know if you've ever seen the authorized version update. Nobody even knows about that. I've got a copy of it. It's interesting, but it um, doesn't really help anything. Nobody really gets it. The MEV came out not too long ago, and I did a critique on it. You can get a copy of that. I've, I've got a bunch of books. You can, a couple of, anyway. You can look it up on Amazon. I didn't bring them with me uh, because... Um, uh, you, you probably wouldn't want to buy it anyway. But I did a little critique on the ESV and one on the MEV. Little, little books you can stick in your bathroom on the back of the stool. You don't have anything else to do. But um, you can get them on Amazon. If you look me up on Amazon, you can find those books. But the MEV blew my mind. Brother Brown, I don't know if you knew this, but you know we do have a lot of guys watching YouTube. And the editor of the MEV called me after my presentation at the KJV conference and told me that they were fixing some of the problems <laughs> that, that we talked about. And so my book is outdated now because the new edition doesn't have some of the problems, some of the things he disagreed with and some of them they fixed. But um, the MEV was considered the modern English version and some of the guys, um, I won't mention their names, but you know, different states like Arizona and Las Vegas and places like that. Some of those Baptist preachers that are out there talking about a lot of things, they, they embrace the MEV and the e, you know, ESV and say they're good. I'm going to tell you something. The MEV is not a good Bible. The ESV is not a good Bible. The Legacy Standard Bible, God bless John MacArthur and anything he's done for the cause of Christ, but the LSB is not a good translation. It's not the answer. To, so, But a lot of these guys have translated it and tried this updating and none of these have been widely accepted amongst KJV people because of, uh, because of glaring mistakes. Um, some of these, some of these um, Bibles have, have followed the same problems of the new version. Let me just show you one real quick that's not on everybody's radar. Go to Hebrews 3.16. Would you do this? I want to tell you something that happened. I got to give you this. I got about... 15, 20 minutes left to get the rest of these in. I got eight more. Okay, so Hebrews 3, verse 16 says, are you there? Hebrews 3, 16. Remember, just remember this. John 3, 16. Hebrews 3, 16. Just remember that. Hebrews 3, 16. Watch this verse. Um, For some, when they had heard, did provoke, how be it, not all that came out of Egypt, my Moses. A little verse. Just, thank you for putting that up there. Just a little verse. Innocuous verse. For some, when they heard, did provoke. Now, the word provoke could be translated rebelled. So, the NKJV, the MEV, the ESV, they use the word rebelled. Okay, that's one of those things. Okay, your altar of ed, whatever, I'm not going to argue with you. Okay, it could be rebelled. Here's what happened. In all of those versions, if you got copies of those versions, they changed the second part to a question. And they say, did not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. So the verse reads, for some, when they heard, rebelled against Moses. We know that's true. Second part of the verse, did not all that come out of Egypt rebel. Now, let me ask you if you, there's a problem with that. Can anybody, can anybody tell me anybody that did not rebel coming out of Egypt? Yeah, Joshua, Caleb. Joshua, Caleb, at least two that we know of. We know their names. So that would make that verse... Wrong. So Paul didn't know what he was talking about, right? Paul says, boy, everybody came up. Um, let me just say this. That's anti-Semitic and has Kittle overtones in it. Okay. So you look at this verse that a lot of them miss. First verse I go to in every one of these new versions, LSB, all of them, is Hebrews 3.16. Because if they change that to an interrogative on the second thing, I know they followed the other trans, they followed that. Okay. And, and most of them aren't catching that. Now they will, but, you know, that's okay. So here's the thing. I went back to the Greek to find out why they changed it. Okay, so if you messed with that, why did you do what? I mean, you guys just make decisions. Just 
Okay, this ought to be a question everybody did. You know, let's just do this. How did they come up with that? So I looked at the text. They were, they were you know, the nest, nestle are, are a lot. And what happens is there is a, in the Greek language, there is a, if it's a capital letter, I believe it was capital letter, there, it changes that last part into an interrogative statement. It's a capital letter. If it's a lowercase letter, it's a declarative statement. So an interrogative statement, a question, changes it to what they've done. So I checked Nestle Arnon, capital letter, turned it to a question. Okay. So let me, let me see what the Texas Receptus says. So I went to Bible Hub. Anybody use Bible Hub? Okay. So I went to Bible Hub and I looked up, is it the Stephanus translation? I told you about this. So the 15, so I looked up the Stephanus translation, which we is our base text. Lo and behold, on the Bible Hub, capital letter. It's an interrogative statement. I'm like, wait, 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 wait. Something's wrong. About that time, Brother Brown came over to our church and had his present. I said, You got a Stephanus Bible? He said, Yeah. So I looked up, I took his copy of the Stephanus Bible, the actual copy. It's not a capital letter, it's a small letter. Yeah, that's right. They changed it. They changed it on the computer Greek text. Watch your computer Greek text. Now, I'm going to tell you something. The devil slipped that one in real quiet. It's easy for us to find the verses that are missing. And the LSB goes back and they put in those verses, put them in brackets. You got use KJV people, just quiet down, calm down, quiet down. But they left that, which makes that verse actually not true. Let God be true and every man a liar. My dad used to always say, figures don't lie, but liars figure. And that's true. Just remember the devil is the father of lies and he will sneak his lies in as best he can. Wow. Um, all the attempts. So if I say, hasn't this already been attempted? I'm going to jump through the rest of my points on this number because I've got some other things I want to get to. If we, if we've already attempted it and every attempt has either gone up in smoke because nobody has the money to back it. Or they've gone down the bad path and followed the other translations. Isn't there something here to be afraid of? Remember the altar of Ed? There's some things we ought to be afraid of. Should we be afraid of maybe if we decide we're going to update? Is it possible that we could follow into the same trap? And boy, we could use all of our computer Greek stuff. And whoa, it's already been messed with. Okay, third question. Who would determine which words need to be changed? If we're updating the King James Bible, who would determine? So this, this brother, uh, uh, Jared yesterday uh, said he wasn't going to mention his name, but so I'll just, I'll just follow. And so if you know what I'm talking about, this guy came out with this new version or new Bible about the authorized version and everybody needs to be quiet and comfortable and teach these guys that don't know anything, teach us something about how we should use these new versions and just lovingly direct us to eat things, sacrifice to idols, brother Dave. So, huh? You want to know his name? His name's Mark Ward. Okay. God bless him. Thank you for his effort. His attitude seems to be good, but it's patronizing. And Mark, if you're watching this, I'm offended by the patronizing tone that you use in the book. Um, he says this, abstain from all appearance of evil. Today, this means, and this meaning is proverbial all around the English speaking Christian world, that Christians should... Be careful not to do things that look evil to others, even if those things are innocent and wholesome. In 1611, they meant, well, to be honest, I'm not perfectly certain what it meant. I think it meant to abstain from every instance of evil. Okay, Mark. So now you're the authority on what this phrase meant? Yeah. Um, so he talks about, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, Romans 4. Today, this sounds like a slightly odd metaphor communicating that Abraham wasn't shocked by God's promises. In 1611, this meant he didn't doubt or waver in his faith. 
So, Brother Ward, I read through his list of troublesome things. And one of the arguments, uh, he, he created an argument, I would call it a straw man. He said that King James people, they like the King James because they feel like it sounds like God's talking. I'm like, I don't know anybody that thinks that. <laughs> who, who does that? I mean, oh, God speaks, thou shalt. I don't know how, he doesn't even speak English, my friends. I don't, well, when he talks, we understand in our language. I don't know what language he's talking. But I'm, I don't know whether he... You know, if, if, you, if you're Elizabeth in English, you would hear thou. If you're American or if you're Southern, you'd hear y'all. I don't know if that's, I don't know how God, but Mr. Ward has these problems with all these words and the problems that he has with these phrases. I've grown up with those phrases. Like Jared said yesterday, he's like, my kids, I, always, I knew what it meant. He's he saying, well, this really confused me. I'm like, well, God bless you. I'm, I'm sorry it confused you. I'm glad you figured it out finally. You can put it in the Bible, but I've known it since I was nine years old. What that meant. Staggered not. And I love the words a friend of mine said to me when he switched from the NIV to the King James. It was like going from a butter knife to a steak knife. Amen. I'm like, yeah, this is, I cut the words are just great. You know, I love them. They're strong, manly. They're not sweet and soft. Cut. So who would determine? Let me, let me show you. Let me show you this. So, so let's use an extreme here. This, this is the cotton patch version of Paul's epistles. So I don't think I can read exactly what it says. But um, so Romans 3, 1. What advantage hath the Jew? Much every way. I've quoted Chiefly to them was committed the oracles of God, right? Here's the Cotton Patch Version, 1968. What's the advantage then of being a Christian? Or what's the benefit of church membership? Well, there are all sorts of things. In the first place, Christians are trustees of the word of God. All right. So some of them are hypocrites. Does their hypocrisy nullify God's sincerity? Bleep? No. It's spelled H-E-L-L. In here. Okay, so this is another one. So, um, Galatians. So, they have a little footnote here to help you understand the translation. He said, the Greek word, Petros. Are you ready for this? Buckle your seatbelts. This is deep theological truth. and This is some insider information about words. You guys know what Petros means? Okay, just in case you didn't know. Peter means rock and is so translated here. His last name was Barjona, which means son of John or John's son or Johnson. Thus, Peter's full name may be accurately translated Rock Johnson. <laughs> Call Dwayne up and say, hey, Pete. Huh? Dwayne the Rock? Now, this is 1968. This is before Dwayne the Rock became a thing. Dwayne the Rock Johnson? You don't know who that is? Okay, I don't either. I have no idea. Um, so... So, okay, so listen to this, Galatians 2. 14 years later, because of an insight I had, I went again to Atlanta with Barney. Five? <laughs> Taking Titus along with us. There I laid before them the message which I preach among Negroes. Okay, so, so when they understood the privilege with which God had favored me, Jim, Rock, and Jack, the key leaders... Warmly shook hands with Barney and me so that we might work alongside the Negroes and they with the whites. But in spite of all this, when Rock came to Albany, I had to rebuke him to his face because he was clearly an error. For before that committee appointed by Jim arrived, he was eating with the Negroes. When they came, he shrank back and segregated himself because he was afraid of the whites. That's glacial. Okay, so let me, let, this is an extreme case. Nobody takes this seriously. I mean, I found this at Goodwill. You know, somebody even got rid of it, you know, that had it. But I kept it because it was so fun. Uh, that's an extreme case. But that illustrates the point. Who makes the decision what you change the words to? How far do you go? We're going to update it, man. So how far are we going to update it to? What are we going to do? And I want to tell you, there's curse words all through there. Who, who's going who's gonna to change the word letteth? 
He who now lets will let until he be taken away. You know what, what's really fun about the King James Bible is there's depths to it. Let, the word let is a tennis word. You know, when he talks first in 2 Thessalonians 2, he talks about he who now letteth will let. Well, that means hinder. That means catching away. Or that means, look, it's simple. The mystery of iniquity doth already work, right? The Antichrist spirit is already around us, is it not? So he says, he who now letteth will let until be taken away. What's he talking about? He's talking about the Holy Spirit, that he is stopping the Antichrist from doing what he can do until the Holy Spirit by the church is raptured out of here, right? Okay, that's what we believe. So, the word let is a tennis word. If anybody play tennis? Uh oh. <laughs> you play tennis, Brother Doug? Uh oh. So, I'm going to try to do this right. So, if you serve a tennis ball and it hits the net and it falls into play, it is called a let, still to this day. That means you get the ball back, you get to serve again. You can do that the whole game. You can do that a hundred times. That ball hits the top of the net and falls into play. It's not playable, but you get to serve again. So here's the devil. He's got his racket and he keeps trying to get the Antichrist in place. He tried it with Antiochus Epiphanes. He tried it with Hitler. He tried it with, I mean, name every guy that, that you've seen that looks like the Antichrist. And it's a let. The Holy Spirit is that net that's stopping that ball from going fully into play. As soon as that net's taken away, the ball will go in full territory, and it's on. So, I know that everybody doesn't understand that word let, but it didn't take long to figure it out, did it? So you lose the depth, don't you? Leviathan, you're going to change Leviathan? What about cockatrice? Well, let's fix cockatrice. Nobody knows, well, nobody knows what cockatrice is. Okay, so what word are you going to use? I thought you said nobody knows what it is. I think Mark Twain said, the parts of the Bible that bother me are not the ones I don't understand. It's the parts that I do understand. Mm. Okay, here's some other notes I'm going to leave because other guys have touched it. Number four, has the English language changed so much? I've got five minutes left. It's changed so much that the modern unbelievers can't understand the entry-level verses. Has... The Bible changed. This was, this was a thing they're starting to say now. If you guys really care about souls, nobody, nobody's learning. Nobody, nobody can read the King James Bible. And we care about souls. Friends, I've been using the King James Bible this, this year. I've been preaching the gospel for 40 years. Started when I was young. Okay. But um, uh, I was 16 when, when I first started preaching the gospel. About four times a week. Um, been preaching my whole life. And we've led people to Christ. We're now in Mattoon, Illinois. I've been there 10 years. God's increased the ministry. I personally speak, plant seeds in people's hearts between one to 300 people a week, personally. Okay, I'm a King James guy. And you know what? We've, we've seen nurses and doctors come to Christ. I'll get up in church on a Sunday morning. I've, I've led in invitations and we have a small church. It's not a big church. But we'll have five, six people come to Christ. I'll do a funeral using the King James Bible. And I'll always do an invitation to a funeral. Every funeral. Because people are thinking about their mortality. And you'll have five, six, seven, eight people come to Christ. I, we, all the time. We see it all the time. The power of God is not limited. Um, they don't all start tithing. Who cares? He owns a cattle in a thousand hills. I, I know, you know, if you don't want to give him your money, that's between you and him, not me. Not me. And if you guys have a problem with that, that's okay. But um, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Do can, can, you, need, you need an update of that? <laughs> the best they've gotten is taking out the word begotten. God gave his only son, which isn't right, because Jesus Christ, he calls us sons. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. He called us not servants, but sons. So why, does he, why do they say that he's the only son? We're sons too. We're children of God. So, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be said. Well, upon, that's a hard word to get. 
Is it? For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So if we change, what, why are we changing the text? So that lost people get it. They're getting saved in our King James churches all the time. But if we would go to the ESV, uh, and we'd read, well, 1 Corinthians 1.18, and the King James says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Amen? NIV, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Okay, perish, perishing. I get, I get how it's easier to understand. But to us who are being saved is the power of God. Us who are being saved. NIV. Uh, oops. MEV did the same thing. ESV. Here's the, here's the darling, the ESV. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. Wow, folly. That's, that's, a, that's a real current word, isn't it? But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So, oops, it changed. What? They're updating and they're changing things. What about, what about words that could be updated to modern thought? Are there words? Are there words? Boy, I've got some stuff on that. Don't have time. But I've noticed this. When you change the vernacular, you often lose the depth. Um, some foreign concepts, they're just not translation issues. My wife and I were reading through the Bible together this year, and she said to me one morning, in Deuteronomy, she said, people really did this stuff? She said, if there's a rule about this, don't do this with animals. We'll just say that. And she's like, people do that? It's like, if there's a rule about it, that means people are weird. Yeah, well, that stuff updated is gonna, isn't going to fix it. Go to Matthew 27, 28. Don't go there now. We don't have time. Mark 15, 17. John, you're going to find that one of the Gospels says that Jesus was wearing a scarlet robe. One of them says he's wearing a purple robe. One of them says he wears a gorgeous robe. And so was it scarlet or purple? Well, that's the beauty of four Gospels. The beauty of four Gospels is that Look at this. If you would go to a court and you would argue and everybody, every witness has the exact same statement, the judge says you guys got together and collaborated. But these guys, one of them looked at there and he's colorblind, Brother Green. And he said, boy, Jesus was wearing a scarlet robe. Another one of the writers says, well, I saw he was wearing a purple robe. And the proof that they both saw it different with a different color shows us that it is a true account. That's good stuff, right? Why would you update that? Well, let's get it right. No, don't collaborate on it. Just write it the way it says it. You learn things. Would a KJV update encourage people to read the Bible more? Number six. The argument that people don't read the Bible because it's not easy is bogus. Our culture wants to be even entertained. Even schools are moving away from books. Do serious people think that updating the language one more time will draw more folks to the Bible? I already told you, KJV, 55% of the people that read a KJV, or read a Bible every day, read a KJV. 19% that read an NIV, read it every day. It, it didn't change it. it didn't fix. So don't, don't update the King James Bible. Can we get an update today without the influence of the heresies of Westcott and Hort? No. Probably not. I already mentioned Kittle. Let me, let me ask this. Is everything in the Bible supposed to be easy to understand? Remember, remember the, the, the parables? Why are you speaking in parables? So that you can understand, but they can't. You know there's truths in here that when some of these guys write these Bibles and say, I don't understand this, I wonder if the Holy Spirit's not in them. Because he says, I will teach you all things. I will teach you truth. The Holy Spirit is not bound by language, nor is it bound by old language. The Holy Spirit can go across 17 languages at one time. If the Holy Spirit's teaching you, you don't need an updated version. Peter said that some of Paul's writings were difficult. Jesus said sometimes he spoke parables to conceal the truth. Faith requires deep thinking. Let me give you one more question. I'm done. Is it okay to be afraid of losing something God said? Should we be afraid of that? Irenaeus, one of the early church fathers said to Marcion, Marcion was one that believed only one gospel should be presented. 
And he was one of the first ones that started correcting the Bible and cutting things out. We're talking first century. Irenaeus meets him. They're in a conference and Marcion walks up to Irenaeus and says, don't you know who I am? And Irenaeus looks at him and he says, I know who thou art, thou firstborn son of Satan. Nice. Why? Because Marcion was cutting things out. And Irenaeus didn't want anything to do with anybody that messed with taking words away. And I think that's one of the biggest problems with the new Bible version translations is they don't care. They're not afraid. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Get a good, healthy fear and then come back to me and talk to me about updating anything. God bless you. Thank you.